Chapter 11, Cleansing Angelica It was too windy to sit under the ramada in the dusk, and too spooky to wait inside Don Juan's house, so I decided to sit in the car until Carlos or Don Juan returned. I was absorbed in writing up my notes when I heard a knocking on the windshield. I nearly jumped through the car roof. Don Juan was staring through the glass motioning me to roll down the window. Let's go for a walk, he said when I got out of the car. He was carrying a bundle tied to his back like a knapsack. But won't it be dark soon? I said. So much the better, he replied. Obediently, I put on my poncho and sombrero and followed him into the chaparral. According to my compass, which I always carried with me, we were heading in a westerly direction. As I trudged behind him, I noticed his hands. The tips of his middle and ring fingers were curled and pressed against the palms, while the thumbs, index, and pinky fingers were extended in a natural position. Keep your fingers like this and you won't tire yourself, he said holding up his hand for me to see, and positioning your gaze just above the horizon helps to quiet your thoughts. If you succeed, you will have more energy while walking. Where are we going? I asked trying to copy his hand position. To a place of power, he said picking up his pace. Even though I kept my gaze just above the horizon as Don Juan had recommended, I could not quiet my thoughts. I was lining up in my mind all the questions I had been unable to ask him earlier. Now they were bursting to get out. Was it really the power of the mask and dance movements that caused me to have that vision of the deer? I blurted out. The rattling of the cocoons was the line that took you into the dream world and the link that brought you back, Don Juan said. But the dancer himself can move someone with his intent. What do you mean by intent? I asked. I mean that the energy coming out of the dancer can impinge on the energy of the observer and can change the world around him. You, being liquid, were easily moved. But is there really another world one can enter? Do you believe the Yaki myth of the realm of the Monty populated by invisible people? And what about the spirit animals, do they exist? He stopped to peer at me for an instant. After what you've seen, how can you ask those questions? I just want your opinion, I said defensively. The Yaki Indians call it the realm of the Monty, but I call it the world of dreaming, he said. Women are better at slipping into this realm than men because they are less rigid in their expectations and beliefs. Now, no more questions. Let's walk in silence. The distant hills were already bathed in shades of dark purple, and the sky was what my art teachers had always called a perfect watercolor sky, with billowing clouds in different shades of gray, red, and pink. We came towards a clump of green shrubbery and a long row of cottonwood trees. When we were closer, I could see that the upper branches of the trees had been cut off, as if they had been harvested or someone had done a poor job of pruning. Still, it was one of the few areas in the terrain where there was lush vegetation. That's the Yaki River, Don Juan said, pointing to the clump of trees. It cuts across the territory, bringing the only source of water to the land. That's why places along it are power spots. Plants and animals flock to them, as well as spirits that seek moisture. We crossed over a low plank bridge that seemed about to fall apart under our feet. It's not very big, I remarked, looking down. And it's practically dry. Somehow I expected a real river full of water. After the rains, it fills up, he assured me. But it is never very wide. We climbed down the barranca to a creek on the other side, it was one of the areas where the earth was moist. Don Juan told me to be careful because the rocks were slippery. After walking down the creek for a stretch, we sat on a rock. Don Juan took off his knapsack, reached in and handed me a round Mexican bread and an orange, and some thin strips of dried meat. I was famished for I hadn't eaten since lunch. We missed the food at the Holy Trinity Festival because as visitors, it would not be safe for us to eat from the street vendors. I began to peel the orange and wiped my fingers on some dry leaves. 
From where we sat I could hear the trucks rumbling by on the highway stirring up clouds of dust and exhaust. Trucks in Mexico have names given to them by their owners which they paint above the bumper, Don Juan explained. The one that just passed was called Wounded Heart. I wondered how he knew that, for there was no way he could have seen the truck from where we were sitting. I see, he said casually. What does it mean to see, Don Juan? It means different things to different people. Sometimes, it's having the certainty that a thing is so. Other times it's a voice that tells you something specific, or it can be a visual sensation of seeing energy fibers or colors moving around a person, plant, animal or object. It can even be a longing that grips you and doesn't let you go. I have a longing that doesn't let me go, I said. But I don't know what it is. I can never voice it. It comes from so far away. Don Juan looked at me for a moment, then shook his head. That's not seeing, that's called indulging. He let out a spurt of genuine laughter. I wanted to argue with him, but he shook his head. I bet it has something to do with finding love, he said giving me a nudge. I suppose you're right, I conceded, but don't sorcerers love or want to be loved? They do, but not in the way ordinary people fall in and out of love. A sorcerer's affection is peerless. He has no vested interest or personal attachment to his feeling. It is given without any strings attached, and once given, it is never ever retracted. The finality of his statements gave me a chill. It made any notion of love that I had ever come across seem paltry, inferior, and soaked in emotional indulging. I don't know if I could commit myself in such a final, absolute way, I said, offering him half of the bread. Don Juan laughed and said that it had nothing to do with personal choice or commitment. It was rather a question of fate, to which one either acquiesced and acted impeccably or resisted to one's dying breath. The flow of fate bringing people together is rare and mysterious, he said softly. Only a blind fool or knowledge criminal would not acquiesce to such a gift. What is a knowledge criminal? His eyes were glossy as if remembering something that happened long ago. Someone who knows better but obstinately refuses to act upon his knowledge. Then he laughed and said teasingly, Don't worry, this is not a proposition from an old man. I laughed too, but a bit more nervously than I had intended. Don Juan was far from being an old man. Another truck drove by. I wondered where it was going. Perhaps to Mazatlan, or Guadalajara, or even as far south as Mexico City. I commented to Don Juan that I had never been to any of these places. You'll go there soon, he said with such certainty that I was forced to ask, how do you know? Are you seeing again? Carlos will take you there, he said. Zuleika is in Guadalajara waiting for you. She has something to teach you. Can't I stay here with you? I asked, feeling at ease in his company and afraid to death of what Zuleika had to teach me. No, your path is different. We are all bound to help you, but you are not like us. You have to return to Los Angeles. You have other things to do. What will I have to do? I asked alarmed. That is for the spirit to decide. It will tell you and your power will dictate what you are capable of. He nudged me and said softly. You are capable of more than you realize. Just then a gust of wind rustled the leaves of the cottonwood trees. I felt a chill that entered my very bones. The consequence of not being up to the spirit's challenge was too divesting to formulate, so even though I didn't know what that challenge might be, I decided to seize it. Tell me more about the deer dancer, Don Juan. Exactly how does the dancer enter into another realm? Don Juan took off his hat and wiped his forehead with a kerchief he had in his shirt pocket. At first, entering the dream world may be a frightening experience, or it may only seem like a dream from which one doesn't wake up, but for a sorcerer, that dream is real and if you go into that world often enough, it will become real for you too. How can a sorcerer's or yaki say the dream world is real? I asked. 
Can't they tell the difference between the waking state and dreams? For sorcerers, it's real because they can act in the dream state with certainty and control. They stalk their dreams, they can learn things, find things, understand things that are not clear in the everyday world. What kind of things? Things about the future, or what someone is doing miles away. It's a way of seeing beyond what is in front of you. Are you talking about divination, Don Juan? The anthropological literature was full of references of how, in primitive cultures, the shaman enters a trance to see what the future holds, to diagnose illness, or to seek out the proper treatment. African witch doctors were particularly fond of using smoke and charred bones or the liver of chickens to make forecasts. Magic, sorcery, divination, witchcraft, all these areas were a part of the anthropological tradition, yet they always had seemed so far removed from our actual day-to-day -day activities, our personal lives. To the Yaqui, such activities did not seem strange at all. Don Juan, himself, had used his dancing to open the door to the world of the spirits, to a different reality. A world that was for a sorcerer as real and predictable as the everyday world was for us. The magical realm of the Yaqui isn't extraordinary at all, Don Juan said. It's not a part of the supernatural or an aspect of the sacred and profane dichotomy anthropologists so readily set up. How do you know about what anthropologists do? I asked. Arizona is full of anthropologists, he laughed. Especially the tribal areas around Tucson. Someone is always trying to get a poor sucker to answer a questionnaire for a few dollars. They go around making categorization schemes without ever knowing what they are talking about. My sentiments exactly, I said. But I tried telling that to one of my professors once and he accused me of not being professional material and proceeded to kick me out of his office. You have to learn to stalk your professors, Don Juan recommended, or they'll gobble you up for breakfast. Those professors feast on young coeds. How do I stalk them? I asked. Treat the university as a hunting ground. If you go there to be discovered, or to be liked, or to make a statement, you'll fall flat on your face. If they sense you are challenging them, the petty tyrants will put up a fight and they almost always win. How can I overcome them? I asked. They are men, they are petty, and they hold the power. You walk around them on cat feet, and never let them know your opinions or what you are thinking. A consummate stalker has no opinions. He or she adapts to any circumstance, swiftly and smoothly like wind. If they think they have you cornered, you are already somewhere else. Be elusive and beyond containment, but devastatingly powerful. That sounds like a contradiction to me. I said. Just then another gust of wind ruffled the ground leaves. It blew a bunch right into my lap. Don Juan laughed and said I was going to make a superb stalker, provided that I treated everything as controlled folly, and make myself zero so no one would be able to grab hold of me. Besides, only someone who is as light as the wind can pass through the cracks between the worlds, Don Juan continued. What do you mean by the cracks between the worlds? I asked. The sorcerers see that the world of the spirits exists and that there are entities other than human beings and animals that roam the earth, Don Juan said, but they exist behind a wall that is full of cracks, so to speak. A sorcerer takes that knowledge for granted just as Westerners take for granted the belief in God, heaven, the scientific method, or the Pope's infallibility, or walking on the moon or anything else that affects their everyday lives. Are you saying that Neil Armstrong never walked on the moon? Or that he passed through some sort of cosmic crack to get there? Not at all. Only that it takes a tremendous effort for man to bring into his awareness the end result that of a man walking in outer space. Or that a man in Rome is the direct representative of God on earth, or that a virgin conceived a son. In the light of these feats of intending, the knowledge that other entities coexist with man on earth does not take such a great leap of faith. I looked around. I had never regarded spirits as part of my daily world, but as a child I did see shadows coming alive, and had at times, felt the presence of a guardian angel. 
I had also assumed saints, fairies, elves and leprechauns existed, even though I had never seen one. So it was not so difficult to accept that the Yaqui Indians, too, had spirit entities, like the spirit deer I had encountered, who protect and advise them as do our supernatural helpers. If the Yaqui say there is a spirit world and that they learn in dreams, a person would have to experience this kind of learning to know what they are talking about, I told Don Juan. If the Yaqui address themselves to a mythological realm and treat it as reality, in order to understand it, the anthropologist must do the same. He must make their myths his reality. I told Don Juan that it is the anthropologist's task to describe, to the best of his ability, what goes on in another culture, in another reality, the way members of that culture see and live it. Therefore, he has to be as open and accessible to phenomena that he encounters, no matter how strange they might be, no matter how different from his own expectations or experiences. In short, the field worker must suspend judgment while he is doing research. Only in this way might he go beyond his limited way of thinking, his ethnocentrism, and his perceptual bias. Furthermore, by seeing another reality, one's own taken-for-granted reality would lose its ultimate importance. Women make the best sorcerers, Don Juan said, after listening to my discourse, and no doubt the best anthropologists too. Why is that? Because they are much more sensitive than men. They can experience and accept things beyond their range more readily without the insistence on reasserting themselves the way men do. On the other hand, women are much more vulnerable and must be cushioned from the shock of encountering other realities. They tend to indulge and lose their underpinnings at the drop of a hat. I laughed because for a moment I thought he had said women lose their underpants at a drop of a hat. That too, Don Juan said laughing, but unfortunately there is never a shortage of men to support them in that department. In a more serious note he added that if a woman was sober, courageous, and adventuresome, and didn't lose her underpants, she could uncover mysteries beyond her wildest expectations. But doesn't she have to have spirit helpers? I asked. It's true, some spirits are helpers, Don Juan continued. Every person, upon birth, receives a totem animal that protects and advises him throughout his lifetime. Perhaps, yours is the deer. I liked deer. I was born in an area full of forests, and plenty of deer. I enjoyed being in the forest, being still, remaining hidden. I had to agree, I had something in common with deer by way of temperament. What is your totem animal? I asked. The crow. I have always had an affinity with them, ever since my teacher showed me how to become one. I like birds too, I said. I often dream I'm flying. Crows are excellent stalkers, Don Juan added, and some of the Pascola masks depict them. I finish the orange and the rest of the dried meat. The dancer, if he has power, can actually can turn into the animal he portrays, Don Juan continued. I've talked to and observed quite a number of Pascola dancers. For some, the dance is merely a means to show off, but for others the dance is a vehicle. The mask, the music and the mesmeric movement of the cocoon rattles ushered the dancer into the spirit realm. There he can learn about the mysteries of the universe, and even find answers to life's fundamental questions. Don Juan gave me a nudge and I knew he was referring to what I had asked the spirit dear. Or perhaps Carlos had told him about our meeting in the anthropology department when I had asked him the same question. If you meet the deer in your dreams, he advised me, ask him about the meaning of life. He will tell you what you want to know. Is that what you do, Don Juan? Learn in your dreams? Don Juan nodded. And through seeing. Right now I see that there is a patch of Angelica growing over there exactly the plant we came all this way to find. We got up and walked toward the bend in the creek where Don Juan had said the plants were growing. What are the plants for? I asked. They are invaluable for female sorcerers, he said. It gives them sobriety, purpose and cushions them from the erratic perceptual changes that they are prone to, especially during their menstrual periods. 
Earlier as we walked he had stopped from time to time to allow me to examine certain plants at close range. He had cautioned me not to pick any of them but only to remember what they looked like, in case I ever needed to find them. There was manzanilla, sage, and a small plant with blue flowers. He had said that we were not there to gather herbs, but to learn how to store power. He assured me that if I ever needed to heal myself, it would be though manipulating energy directly, not by ingesting any plant. There was one exception to this rule, and that was the angelica plant. We walked up to some large yellow-green plants that looked like tall overgrown celery. They had shot up about a yard and at the tips were tufts of dried stalks with tiny brown seeds. This is Angelica, he said taking off a bit of the leaf and rubbing it between his fingers. It smells like celery, I said taking a sniff. What does it taste like? Find out for yourself, he said and gave me a bit of the seeds to chew. They tasted like bitter celery. Do I make an infusion out of the leaves or seeds? I asked. You can, or you chew on the seeds directly, but in your case it's better to smoke it. How do I smoke it? You first dry the stalks and then crush a bit and put it in a pipe and then touch a lighted match to it. I've never smoked anything in my life, I said. Not even marijuana, he teased. A friend of mine gave me a joint once to try, but I didn't like it. The smoke really hurt my lungs and made me sneeze. You see, I'm allergic to smoke. This is not marijuana, he said seriously. Besides, you probably inhaled too much smoke into your lungs when you should have allowed the smoke to envelope you. What does Angelica smoke do? I asked. It cleans the energy fibers of the body. He stepped back and gave me a groggy look, running his eyes up and down from head to toe. There's a great deal of debris clinging to your fibers in spite of your recapitulation, he said. So in stubborn cases like yours, one has to use smoke to cleanse the double. You don't have to inhale it. Just allow the smoke to caress you. It knows what to do. It will clean you without you having to direct it. Don Juan gathered some of the dry stalks and put them inside his knapsack. He said he would give them to me later. If I ran out, I would have to find the next batch myself. What if I can't come back here? I said. Angelica grows everywhere, he replied, you can find it in abundance in the canyons around Los Angeles. Then you have to let the stalks dry and find a pipe in your dreaming and put some crushed leaves inside. Or you can light the tip of the stalk directly. We sat down on a log and he asked me for a match. I pulled out a matchbook from my pocket, for along with the compass, I always carry a book of matches in my pockets so that I could gaze at its flame whenever I needed to. I wondered how Don Juan knew I had matches with me. He lit a dry stalk about three inches long by holding a match to its tip. Then he moved the stalk back and forth in front of my nose and allowed the smoke to envelop me. The smoke made me cough and my eyes burn and I didn't like the sensation at all, but when the smoke cleared, I experienced a calmness and clarity that was unprecedented. At first I couldn't pinpoint exactly what the difference was, then I realized that my calmness resulted from the fact that my internal dialogue had completely stopped. I had no more thoughts, I was content to perceive directly, without filtering everything through words and thoughts. I felt that the I that was always in command had vanished. Somehow the smoke had made things absolutely still so that there was no separation between the analytical I and the things it thought about. Subtle as it was, it seemed like the difference between night and day. During the day everything is agitated, the streets are full of traffic and noise, the energy of people, and the tension and hurry of life, fills one's being. At night, things quiet down. No one is going anywhere. The birds, too, have settled in their nests and all is at rest. That was the way I felt after I had inhaled only a few puffs of smoke, completely at rest, with no hurry, no worries, everything had returned to its natural place. The world was the way it should be, without the constant interference of thoughts and expectations. It was an exquisite feeling of serenity that the smoke brought. 
It was like burning incense in a church. I began to breathe deeply from my abdomen and relished the tranquility and ease of having nothing to say, nothing to do, and no place to go, except to be where I was at that precise moment in time. It was as if my being had blended with eternity extending in front of my eyes. The angelic smoke is like that, Don Juan said sensing my mood. It expects nothing from you. It humbly does its job of cleansing away the debris of the past. If you are emotionally upset or agitated, surround yourself with angelica smoke. No need to inhale it, and only use it when you feel agitated and need to calm yourself. Never abuse it. Together with the recapitulation, it will serve as a means to cleanse and soothe the erratic bent of your nature. Don Juan reiterated that I didn't need to use a pipe or to really inhale at all. I could just light a bit of the stalk and let the smoke rise while holding the piece of angelica root in my left hand. The effect would be the same. The smell of the smoke around me would be enough to clear my head and cause my internal dialogue to cease. He made a small fire out of wood, then placed some branches of angelica that he had collected from the ground on top of the tire. We sat in front of it for a while and from time to time he used his jacket to fan the smoke in my direction. When the fire had extinguished itself, he took a stick and pointed to the charred remains. Earlier you wanted to know about seeing, he said. The ancient sorcerers of our lineage used many different methods to understand the state of things. They used corn kernels, the patterns in the clouds, the formation of leaves in the trees and on the ground, or after a fire had gone out, the placement of the charred wood.